Welcome everyone to the February general meeting of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. It is great to see a full house here tonight. We have hit the limit on Zoom, so hopefully many more will join us live on YouTube. And of course, we have such a large crowd tonight because we have an excellent guest speaker tonight. One I have been hoping to invite to a KAS meeting or at least an event for the 26 years that I have been involved in the club. Uh, but before we begin, since we do have a large group here tonight, I wanted to give a little plug for the uh, speakers that we have coming up. So allow me to share my screen here and I will show you the general meeting page of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. So you can find this on our website. Let me uh, scroll back up here. And of course, you can go to uh, activities, pull down the general meeting uh, page, and that's the page that we're on now. So of course, you can see we have our speaker here tonight, but let me scroll down here a bit. And you can see for our March 4th meeting, one month from today, we have Dr. Fran Beganol from the University of Colorado, who's going to be talking about the exploration of the outer solar system, the Voyagers and beyond, because in all my years in the club, we've never had a program on the Voyager spacecraft. So she was part of that mission back in the 80s and 70s and 80s. Uh, so I thought it'd be great to have her with us here tonight and I actually met her at Alcon in 2017, right before the total solar eclipse that year. And then you can see on April 8th, we delay the meeting one week. It's usually on the first Friday, but we're doing it on April 8th. We'll have uh, Dr. Melissa Trainer from the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center who will talk about flights of exploration on an exotic ocean world. And that'll be about the Dragonfly mission to Titan. So that'll be very exciting. And then May, again, one of the biggest speakers we've ever had on, on May 6th, we're going to have none other than Dr. Alex Filipenko, one of the prominent cosmologists in the entire world, uh, talk about new a new surprise in the accelerating universe. And so we're again hoping to have a large crowd for that um, meeting on May 6th. And then on June 3rd, we have The Dark Side of Galaxies by Dr. Josh Simon from the Carnegie Institution. So you can... So as you can see, you can go to each one of these and uh, register for the meeting right now so you can have it, you know, uh, on your calendar. You know, Zoom will send you a confirmation. You can add that to your calendar. Or, of course, you can use our Add the Calendar button here. And uh, be sure you join us for one of these speakers. And you can see we're kind of blank in September and November because we're waiting to see if we can meet in person again. Uh, and if we can meet in person, we will have in-person speakers. But we are going to try really, really hard uh, to make sure we at least have those meetings on YouTube, if not live streamed on Zoom or or and or YouTube. So we're we're working on that. So without uh, any further delay, uh, let's jump into our uh, main presentation here. Okay. So, oh boy, I'm so excited. Again, as I mentioned, I've had been hoping to invite tonight's uh, speaker uh, for quite some time. I, I tried to invite him to our Astronomy Day event in 2017, uh, but he had a prior commitment, but instead we had uh, a, a really good lineup in 2017, but uh, I was disappointed that he couldn't join us, but uh, I am so glad he's here with us tonight. And so I just want to mention that um, as I just showed you, we have a lot of great speakers coming up, but we've had lots of great speakers in the past as well. I try to invite, you know, prominent amateur astronomers, professional astronomers. We've had geologists, engineers, historians. We've had some great speakers over the past 20 plus years or so. And those are all people I thought the membership at large would enjoy seeing, you know, people that I, people that I thought would draw out a large crowd. And of course, tonight's speaker has drawn out a large crowd, which I'm very pleased with, but I gotta be completely honest with you, this meeting, this guest speaker more than any other is for me uh, because, uh, because of something that means a lot to me that I'll mention here um, very shortly. So tonight's guest speaker is an internationally renowned astronomer and a veteran 
of 74 solar eclipses. And I'm sure that includes total, annular, partial, probably even a few hybrids here and there. He serves as the Field Memorial uh, Professor of Astronomy at Williams College in Massachusetts and is an authority on solar phenomena. He chairs the International Astronomical Union's Working Group on Eclipses and has received the Education Prize of the American Astronomical Society and the Janssen Prize of the Société Astronomique de France. He is the author of the widely of widely used textbooks in astronomy from high school and college levels. He is also the author, along with the late Donald Menzel, of Peterson's A Field Guide to the Stars and Planets, which is a book that taught many young astronomers in the 1980s and beyond uh, the basics of astronomy, myself among them. So many people have asked me over the years, you know, Richard, how did you learn so much about astronomy? Well, I read Peterson's Field Guide to the Stars and Planets when I first got it in 1984. And for a long time, this was the only book uh, on astronomy that I owned, that and some encyclopedias. So this was the book that taught me everything that I know today, but I've learned a little more uh, since then. You can see I, I have used this book a lot, so much so the, uh, the uh, dust jacket worn off. So this is what the uh, dust jacket looked like when I had it on. This is a used copy that I bought many, many years later, but uh, for me, uh, this is a very, very special book. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Jay Pasikoff. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Richard. It's a great honor to be with you and to hear your uh, nice remarks. I'm glad that the field guide played a role in your astronomy education. Uh, and it was my pleasure when I first started as a freshman at Harvard uh, in 1959, it turns out that Professor Menzel uh, was giving a freshman seminar uh, that I was able to get into. And it just happened that a couple of weeks after the beginning of the semester, there was a total eclipse of the sun that started uh, low in the sky near Massachusetts. Uh, and Professor Menzel borrowed a DC-3 from Northeastern Airlines and took his class of a dozen up to see the eclipse. So that was the first eclipse that I, uh, that I saw. So now I've been to 36 total eclipses, including 74 of all kinds. And I'm gonna to talk to you tonight, especially about the most recent eclipse uh, and uh, something uh, about uh, the ones uh, in the last few years. And then I'm gonna end up with the future eclipses that you can see from Kalamazoo and, uh, and elsewhere. So if I have authority to share my screen. Um, let me, is it, it's not on that desktop. Let's see where, it's this one here. Okay, and, and then let me move the participants off to the side, if I can figure out how to do that, the gallery. Uh, the, there, let's see. I wanna get... Okay, so let me talk about especially the most recent eclipse of the sun, which uh, took place uh, just about a month ago, uh, and it was in and near Antarctica. I, uh, of course, was looking forward to working with my colleagues. Uh, I had a couple of students with me, Peter Knowlton, Anna Tussolini, some alumni, which is uh, Bujo Lu. Uh, and I've been working for a while uh, with some Greek astronomers, including Aris Vulgaris, who took this very nice, beautiful series of, uh, of images from uh, in, in 2019, when I was already arranged to be on the center line, where it came into Chile from the Pacific, 
Uh, and then I, of course, I'm competitive. So I was one of those handful that won a, 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 a slot at the Saratololo Inter-American Observatory, which was uh, higher up, uh, but a little off the center line. Uh, and here's a series that Aris got here, the obvious eclipse in the middle. But on the left, you see the double diamond ring effect that, that was notable for this eclipse. Uh, so there are uh, irregularities on the edge of the moon, for those of you who don't know about Bailey's beads, um, and, uh, and the sun itself is a million times brighter than the solar corona. So uh, as the moon entirely covers the sun, um, they first kiss at what we call first contact, and then the moon covers the entire sun at what we call center contact, but there's a, a few valleys on the edge of the moon that are the last little bits uh, that allow sunlight through. And that's what we're seeing on the left. And then, and then over a few seconds, they get covered up and we get the eclipse in the center that lasts uh, however long, a couple of minutes is ordinary. Uh, seven minutes is the maximum. We're not gonna have that for a very long time. And then after these uh, couple of minutes, we, uh, we get third contact where the moon moves off the sun. And we see that on the right, the first uh, one looks so dazzling. It looks like a diamond on a, uh, on a ring. Uh, and that notation of the diamond ring came really from the 1925 eclipse uh, over New York. I've been uh, fortunate to have the National Science Foundation sponsoring my research. And for a series of, uh, of uh, observations the National Geographic Society, uh, and then we have additional funds for various uh, things from NASA and the Honorary Society Sigma Xi and, and Williams College. And I've been fortunate to have a few visiting uh, relations and uh, a lasting visitor status with the Carnegie Institution of Science, which now runs the Mount Wilson uh, uh, Observatory. Uh, Fred Espinak has been very uh, helpful, of course, by, well, first of all, in general, running the NASA site for a long time. And when he retired from NASA, he set up his information at eclipsewise.com. Uh, He's been kind enough to graph all the eclipses that I've seen, not quite the last few yet, uh, but we have this posted on my website at the totalsolareclipse.org, uh, which then has some slides and links from each of the eclipses that I've been to, plus the couple of transits of Venus and the several uh, transits of, uh, of Mercury. I like this picture from uh, NASA's Discover uh, mission um, in, in which we see the moon uh, superimposed in front of the earth and for an eclipse, instead of where the, uh, the spacecraft is for this image, will uh, we'll have the sun there uh, blocked, by, uh, blocked by the moon. Uh, here is a graph that, um, well, a map that Fred uh, Espinac kindly made for me. Uh, well, no, uh, you saw the one made for me. This is the one posted on his website at eclipsewise.com for all the eclipses in the current decade, 2021 to 2030. And, and, and so here's where that eclipse, uh, well, uh, the one that we saw a couple of weeks ago uh, went over Antarctica and I was on a plane that flew out of uh, Punta Arenas in Chile and we intercepted at 41,000 feet, the eclipse just inside the sunrise point. And then the eclipse went down uh, over Antarctica and there were several uh, groups of people on Antarctica into uh, sets of people who had cameras from me and will be working on all those uh, eclipse observations. The, that uh, Discover spacecraft uh, was able to view two eclipses uh, this year. And one is the annular uh, eclipse that went over the North Pole uh, and had it not been for COVID travel restrictions preventing me from entering Canada or, uh, or Greenland, uh, we, I would have uh, been probably in Greenland, but in any case, it's fun that in 2021, 
we had first an eclipse that was an annual eclipse in, in May, uh, and then later on, and uh, the in December, obviously, I'll get back to the to the shadow at the very bottom, uh, which will be the total eclipse uh, that took place in December that you see here. Uh, so we can uh, I'll show a video uh, later uh, later on. Uh, Dr. Menzel, of course, was an important mentor for me. He went to entirely too many meetings as director of the Harvard Observatory, and he uh, worked on his doodling skill. And uh, he had this beautiful uh, uh, eclipse and sun. For, for me, you see the streamers coming off to the sides. You see the polar plumes coming off the North Pole and, and the uh, South Pole. And he colorized this one for me. I was able to use that for my PhD thesis uh, eventually. I like this XKCD comment, how cool it sounds, like it would be along the X axis, and then how cool it's seen in person. And you can see that the total eclipse is way over the top uh, of uh, how cool it is to actually see in person. So I, I can't ask for a show of hands from the hundred of you uh, showing now, but I hope you've all been, and probably most of you have been, to an eclipse. Of course, I'm a scientist, so I have a series of scientific goals for studying the sun. We're in particular, we're studying the sun's magnetic field and how that changes over the 11-year sunspot cycle. We're now in a rising time of the cycle with the maximum expected in 2024 or so. Uh, and then sometimes we get a coronal mass ejection uh, we didn't have one at this eclipse, but uh, but last eclipse uh, there uh, there was one, and we could see uh, well an eclipse comet even. Excuse me, the uh, the last time and a coronal mass ejection the time before that, and then I'm working especially with Aris Vulgaris on the uh, spectra on the spectra that he takes, and uh, there are some traditional spectral lots from heavily ionized iron. Uh, if you take iron, neutral iron would be iron one, and you heat it a bit and it ionizes and you get iron two, and you can see that to get to iron 14, it's got to be really pretty hot, over a million degrees uh, Celsius. And that's in fact, was the proof that, um, that the corona is very hot. So the iron 14 line was discovered in, in 1870, and it took 70, 70 years until around 1940, uh, before the iron 14 and the iron 10 lines were identified, especially by Ed Lane, um, and also uh, some work by, by uh, Grotrian um, to, uh, to show how hot the uh, corona is. And, uh, and Aris has identified uh, argon 10, nine times ionized argon. And, uh, and just today, he, he wrote me about some calcium uh, 15, uh, so um, uh, so we're working away on our spectra. Uh, and then the, the question is, not only is the corona a million degrees hot, but how does it get there? And there are several different theories in how to heat the corona to millions of degrees. And some of my research work is devoted to testing those theories. And in particular, we have some special apparatus to test a theory that it's very high frequency uh, variations, vibrations of loops at the uh, edge of the corona, the uh, edge of the solar disk. And uh, by vibrating uh, more often than, uh, than once a second, uh, it can set up some vibrations and, and, uh, and heat the lower corona that then, that then spreads. But uh, I do, point out that there are a dozen different solutions to the question of how the uh, eclipse is heated to uh, millions of degrees. The corona is uh, heated to millions of degrees, and maybe some of them are working at the same time. Uh, and then I've been working with the late Marcos Peñalosa Murillo on terrestrial weather. Uh, when we snuff out the last uh, part of, uh, of the uh, sun, from heating the earth uh, over the path of totality. It's getting a darker by a factor of a million. And even in the last minute, 
by a factor of a thousand and uh, gravity waves are sent out in the Earth's atmosphere and other changes that we've been studying. We have a series of papers about that. Uh, I was fortunate this last eclipse uh, that went over Antarctica and uh, started in the ocean east of Chile and Glenn Schneider from the University of Arizona uh, plotted out a path for a, a plane that got uh, chartered. Uh, and here is a view that I took uh, out the window of what wound up being uh, a Boeing 787 uh, Dreamliner. And you can see the shadow of the moon coming in here. And the dark disk, of course, is the moon and uh, with the corona around it. And here we're looking hundreds of miles away uh, to where there isn't uh, uh, a total eclipse. Here's in it anymore. Um, Len Schneider had worked out the path for us to fly from Punta Arenas uh, near Chile in, over the Scotia Sea here and intercept the eclipse near, uh, near sunrise. And then it continued for another hour to Union Glacier where uh, uh, Janet Boris and Theo Boris, my student uh, Christian Lockwood were, were there. Uh, and then uh, Pato uh, Rojo, a professor at the University of Chile, all, also had some cameras of ours uh, to uh, image the eclipse there. And we have data from all those locations. So we flew out from Punta Arenas. Uh, and of course, we worried about getting through the COVID restrictions and flying from the United States to uh, Santiago and then down the night before to Punta Arenas, and then eventually uh, into the path of totality, in which we got one minute and 52 seconds of, uh, of totality in the early morning, soon after sunrise. Uh, it turns out that we were going essentially due south from, uh, uh, from the United States. It's quite not as one way back, for example, to Santiago, and then we continued south to Punta uh, Arenas. We'd seen an eclipse near Antifagasto uh, 25 years ago, and we went over Santiago and all the way down to the to a Punta Arenas near the tip of uh, of Chile. Have a, a number of scientific reasons that Glenn worked out for uh, for why we want to do all this science. Some of it is is just getting amazing views, uh, but and some of it is getting uh, a little longer a totality to make our observations, but we get good contrast in the corona because the sky uh, is, is darker. We can potentially see a little further in the infrared and, and ultraviolet. Um, and uh, so there are a number of reasons why, in addition to just getting access to the uh, total solar eclipse. Here is a graph of the sunspots from the uh, uh, Royal Observatory of Belgium's a sunspot indices center. And you can see that we were at a solar minimum around 2020, but now that it's 2022, it's really picking up. And by 2024, 25, we'll see the sunspot uh, maximum, whether it, that'll be uh, higher or lower or about the same as the last sunspot maximum, uh, we're gonna have to wait and see because there are different uh, theories about uh, how to predict when that is. So the yellow is the daily uh, sunspots. You see there are almost no sunspots on the sun for a while in 2020, but now there are sunspots on the sun uh, just about every day. Um, so in any case, we flew off with my students, Anna Tosolini and Peter Nalton and our alumnus, Mujo Lu. And here we, uh, just before midnight, uh, the LATAM charter flight uh, flew to a Punta Arenas with our, uh, with our group. Here I am on the tarmac wearing my traditional orange pants for eclipses. Here's my wife, Naomi, with our uh, student, Mujo Lu, and here's our group waiting to board. And uh, David Slisky, who just getting his PhD in, uh, in exoplanets from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, helped me uh, be in charge of, of the students and, uh, and uh, uh, we had Emma Sobel, high school student, uh, joining, joining us. Nicole, Nicole uh, Mazzetti uh, joined too.
So uh, we uh, boarded the plane and uh, flew uh, almost due east for a while. Uh, the pilots were excellent pilots and they had to match the timing uh, precisely with a little delay. Uh, and, uh, uh, and here is the captain with me uh, after the, uh, the successful flight and uh, Tim Todd, who uh, arranged it, and here's sunrise out the windows. There was a, an almost disaster uh, a week before the eclipse when the Falkland Islands that had been the, the emergency stop place of one of the engines went out on the chartered Airbus 321. Um, and uh, Tim uh, arranged with LATAM instead of the Airbus 321 to uh, take the uh, Boeing Dreamliner 787 with these bigger uh, windows and a more expensive plane, which we're still uh, trying to pay for, um, but it had to be done uh, because the Boeings, if an engine goes out, had enough uh, strength in the remaining engine to meet the international safety regulations, whereas the Falkland Islands uh, denied uh, potential access uh, if the Airbus 321 engine went out and the, the flight would have had to have been canceled if Tim hadn't made that arrangement. Now remember the Dreamliner is a wide body, but we don't care about the wideness of the body because, uh, because we're basically having somebody just in the window and uh, we care about the long body, uh, which it isn't, but we did have this and in fact there were two planes and I was on the upper one at 41,000 feet, a thousand feet or so below uh, was a secondary uh, plane. But unfortunately there was a deficiency and here's one of the telephotos with uh, David Slisky uh, there um, in that these windows are self dimming. And to do that, there are some chemicals and crystals in the window. So the actual images from the Boeing 787 even though the windows are bigger, uh, the images are not as clear as they would have been uh, on in the Airbus. Uh, anyway, here is uh, just a, a quick, uh, a quick picture of the uh, of the eclipse with a diamond ring uh, here. So I had um, my uh, iPhone to take this image that I already showed you with the uh, umbra here uh, and uh, surrounding the eclipse. The plane turned a little bit to tip uh, during totality uh, and, uh, and we lost some seconds in doing that. The, I was working in particular again this time with a group of scientists at Predictive Science in San Diego, who use the uh, the Corona? I'm sorry, the uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory's measurements of the magnetic field on the surface of the sun. So the sunspots and the magnetic regions in which the sunspots are there, and they have a, a month of the solar rotation. Of course, about half that time, the the groups are around the back, so uh, those are a little out of date. But a couple of weeks before, and then finally a few days before the eclipse, they make a prediction of what the eclipse is actually going to look like. And then, and then I have been working, especially with Wendy Carlos from New York, uh, and uh, and also uh, with uh, some of the other uh, people we've uh, worked with to put together uh, the actual observation. And then, uh, uh, and then we can put these together. And there was a press release out of NASA. Uh, well, last year was a couple of days uh, after the eclipse and this year was a couple of days longer uh, than that. So here is a link to the uh, actual observation here. And as they posted it with a slider that can come over to show uh, all our observations or go the other way uh, to show all, uh, all those observations from uh, from the, uh, well, the predictions from the predictive science group and link them uh, together. So here's their final uh, prediction a few days before. 
the uh, totality. And here is the shape of the corona that they predicted. So remember that because we're not actually going to operate the slider uh, in this uh, video uh, now in my PowerPoint presentation. But uh, they can uh, um, have a logarithmic view of the strength of the streamers that match a little more what the eye might see. And uh, here's the final uh, prediction uh, that they posted. So this is the early phase of the new solar cycle. So the uh, corona appearance can change rapidly uh, in, in several days. So they had the latest magnetic field data on November 21st. And remember the eclipse was December uh, 4th, so about two weeks later. Uh, and, and so they can really uh, uh, show the details in the shape of the corona from their calculations. And, uh, and in fact, uh, show the magnetic field lines as they come out of the sun and show the surface of the sun in the magnetic field regions. Here is our full uh, image. And I mentioned David Slisky, students from Williams College, Peter Knowlton, Anna Tosolini, Emma Sobel, a high school student who was with us, Udra Lou from a class of 13, Aris Vulgaris from, um, um, uh, from Greece. Uh, Nicole Mazzetti is uh, the fiance of David Siski and my wife Naomi. And we were really glad to have our major support from the Natural Science Foundation, Atmospheric and Geospace Sciences Division. Note that it's not the astronomy division. Somehow the eclipse work is in a different for, uh, division of the NSF. And we have various support from, uh, from Williams College. So here's our slider uh, again. And here's my view out the window again. So Aris uh, got some nice uh, spectra, iron 14 and iron 10, and he continues to, uh, to observe here at the apparatus out two of the windows there with special braces that he had built. And here is the iron 14. Uh, image uh, around the surface of the uh, of the sun here from these active regions uh, here where the the hotter gas is uh, is brighter here and here's some spectra that uh, uh, with the sodium uh, lines in the middle and in fact it's from spectra like this that near the the um, sodium D lines we have a line from helium, and this is uh, doubled from the different size of the sun, and it was in 1858 uh, that uh, Janssen uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, India especially identified that there was a bright a yellow line near the sodium D lines, and then also that it was potentially bright enough there, uh, to see outside of eclipse and so, the, and the, which he verified the next day. And though we often say that Lockyer uh, teamed up in discovering uh, what turned out to be helium, it was really that Lockyer wasn't around, he'd been ill. And when he got his spectrograph a few months later, uh, he worked uh, from England to see the, uh, this extra yellow line and it appeared to exist only on the sun. So they called it uh, helium. So in 1878, uh, they saw the spectral line. It took another 30 years till 1895, till uh, geologists on Earth identified the gas that is now called helium. And, and then uh, the next year um, in the United States, there was an eclipse from which the iron 14 line was, was discovered. Uh, so here again is a view of the apparatus of Aris out the window and, uh, and, and the active regions with the coronal green line. Uh, Andreas Muller, who was not affiliated with us, but who we were friendly with, um, was on Antarctica and, uh, and he got this beautiful image of, of the uh, first Bailey's bead, diamond ring, uh, and from 
the point of view uh, way down on Antarctica to a different location around the circle than, uh, than one would uh, expect. Uh, and, and then his, uh, uh, he uh, allowed us to work on some of his images. Uh, and in particular, uh, we, had, uh, we, we had some of our own observations that we used together uh, and then Mujalu put it together with the uh, streamers in the outer part of the sun from the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, a Naval Research Laboratory uh, instrument on the European Space Agency's um, a solar and heliospheric observatory. And you can see, uh, but, but because it's so bright at the edge of the sun, the uh, coronagraph on SOHO uh, couldn't go all the way down to the surface of the sun and has left this donut for us to observe at eclipses. Uh, and then uh, working with Dan Sutton, Seton, an alumnus of ours uh, who worked with, with a couple of different devices, including the solar ultraviolet imager on the GO spacecraft. Uh, we have a different uh, extreme ultraviolet images uh, that here one is pasted on what otherwise would be the black surface of the moon facing us, the dark side of the moon. And you can see then the opportunity to paste, to follow the streamers down to their origins on the disk of the sun, uh, except of course for the half that are around the other side. Uh, so here is our composite image and the credit here with the center image from Suvi on GOES-16 and 195 angstroms at about a million and a half degrees assembled by Dan Seaton, and then the outer coronagraph from the Solar Heliospheric Observatory and the Naval Research Laboratory. Uh, so here is a, another one of those images in December 4th, just about on the hour. And with some colorization uh, and labeling, you see the extreme ultraviolet, 195 angstroms, and our eclipse image filling in the gap here uh, until the Soho coronagraph. And you can see the continuity of the streamers, for example. Uh, Peter Horolek was on uh, one of the planes and, uh, and there was a lower plane and he, with his wide angle, uh, turned and looked back and saw the whole umbra and, and could see our plane flying above, uh, above him. Um, and, uh, and again, the uh, eclipse in the sky. So here's the path of the eclipse. So we flew out here and intercepted it here. And then an hour later, it reached, uh, well, uh, Antarctica, here the, uh, the Union uh, Glacier. Uh, uh, and uh, so here, it's seven o'clock, which was our image, and then eight o'clock, they're in the middle of the Union uh, Glacier there. So it's an unusual path. For the, uh, for the eclipse. Uh, we uh, gathered afterward in, well, in the, in the hotel uh, where uh, with, a, with a plaque for the old Antarctic explorers from, uh, from 100 years ago. And in fact, right where we were in the Weddell, uh, well, close to, that we overflew the Weddell Sea, is where there's an article in the New York Times today that uh, they think they can possibly find Shackleton's uh, a boat that has been sunk there uh, and that they're going to try to, uh, to, uh, to go off in a, in a boat with cameras on fiber optics to go down and photograph it at 10,000 feet underneath the ice. And if the boat doesn't work, in fact, go onto an ice flow uh, which sounds pretty dangerous uh, with uh, cameras uh, down to try to find out about uh, whether they can see Shackleton's boat. 
Uh, anyway, uh, so here, I'm looking down on the lower of the two flights, the Lata flight, as we, uh, as we went off, and after the eclipse the, uh, with the pilots. Uh, anyway, uh, so Catalan uh, in the lower uh, plane could look up and see, uh, see our plane, uh, for example, and there is a YouTube movie that uh, Bob Stevens made. So we were successful uh, from the plane. Now I worked with uh, Theo Boris, who had ordered my class last year, a collegiate high school student in New York, and his mother, uh, Janet Boris, and father, Peter Boris, uh, and, uh, and they were with uh, our alumnus from the class of 2020, uh, Christian Lockwood, and, uh, and uh, David Zimmerman from, from some of the research group. And I've just brightened the image there to show their faces, but here they are actually are on Union Glacier in Antarctica. Uh, and here's some of the, uh, the, set, the uh, uh, setup there for observing this uh, beautiful uh, and sharp image uh, that, they, uh, that they have. And so we're working still on the various uh, composite images we had temperature measuring devices for, to work with, um, with our uh, uh, <clears throat> meteorological physics uh, expert, Marcos Peñaloza Murillo. And here's the uh, irradiation, the sunlight uh, dipping as it must during the eclipse and then various temperature measurements that we, uh, that we had. And, and here is uh, a, a composite uh, that we used in the NASA press release um, with, uh, with a couple of the images from Antarctica, uh, and we have more images than, uh, than that. Uh, from APOD, there were a couple of, there were several days of eclipse images, uh, and here's Stephanie Yi, uh, she just took a picture every hour, and, and you could see uh, the unusual eclipse uh, in this uh, uh, land of the midnight sun and Antarctica at, uh, the, in December. And, uh, and then from the South Pole itself, where there's a South Pole telescope for studying the cosmic background radiation, uh, here's the series. So they were, they were not in totality, uh, but so these are all through a filter, but here's the series over 24 hours. Anyway, uh, 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 Pato uh, Patricio Rojo, the professor from the University of Chile, who actually came up to Williamstown to get some equipment from me, uh, got uh, 33 successful frames uh, from the Antarctic ice. And we've been working with that. And Roman Venur uh, is our computer specialist. And I work especially with uh, Wojto Ruschen uh, in Slovakia. Uh, to uh, analyze the data and the, uh, and the streamers. Uh, and so here is a, a beautiful composite based on the 33 successful frames that, uh, that Patricio took uh, with, uh, with his Sony cameras. He actually had three cameras and one of them froze uh, and, and the other was uh, out of focus. Uh, but one of these cameras gave these 33 beautiful frames that we are uh, that we are working on, and we're very pleased with that. So this is a composite. I told you that you could see the shadow. This is now a loop, and so here we are in Antarctica, and here is the uh, the umbra going over Antarctica, and I slowed it down here. Uh, so here. So here's the actual shadow you see elongated coming over Antarctica. And I do like this picture that I showed you of the eclipse from NASA's Discover, the epic camera on Discover, uh, showing the shadow uh, very near the North Pole. Here's the path, the partial eclipse here. You can see 
the uh, the path of totality and how it enlarges there. Um, one of the uh, International Space Station astronauts, uh, uh, Kayla Barron, sent down this this picture from space with the Umbra over Antarctica. Well, once we were in uh, close to Antarctica and in Punta Arenas, we took advantage the day after the eclipse to go and see some penguins. Now, uh, we put together a paper for the meeting of the American Astronomical Society that was supposed to be in January uh, in, in Salt Lake City. Uh, so, and here's our abstract for uh, three spectrographs by Bulgaris and a minute 52 seconds of, of uh, totality. And here's our position. But that meeting was canceled for COVID reasons of the American Astronomical Society. So we'll give a later version of this at the following meeting, if that goes on in Pasadena in June, and then the Solar Physics Division meeting uh, in, uh, in August. So here's our uh, part of our abstract of, and updated the chartered LATAM Airlines Boeing 787, 41,000 feet, another one, 1,000 feet to lower. And then four of our people were on Union Glacier on Antarctica with their uh, position uh, here. And Patricia Rojo was uh, taken down by the Chilean Air Force. And, uh, and then uh, we have the credit here to the Solar uh, Terrestrial Program of the Atmospheric and Geospace Sciences Department. And, an endowment at Williams College from my late colleague Freeman Foote. I paid for most of the students' travel and Tim Todd uh, arranged it. So uh, what next? Well, uh, there are several different uh, sources online, including especially Fred Espinax uh, to show the future eclipses. This one's from timeanddate.com and you can see the path as it comes up and just and totality clips the extreme upper left-hand corner of Australia and goes up to East Timor, but the weather statistics, which are compiled by Jay Anderson, a meteorologist from Canada, with whom I wrote a Peterson Field Guide to Weather that just uh, came out a few months ago. Um, the weather statistics are much worse here. So those of us who want to see the eclipse are working on ways to, uh, to get to, to there, so it'll be quite crowded there, assuming we're allowed into Western Australia. Now, Professor Menzel again to go back for our article in Mexico and about the 1970 eclipse, uh, drew the path uh, here and, and of course projected the moon where it, it, uh, onto the earth uh, where, it, where it hit. And I've been in touch with people from Southern Mexico and me or Atlanta in particular who want to come with us for uh, for the eclipse on April 8th, uh, 2024, which we hope to intercept uh, right in Mexico, especially near the coast at Mazatlan, where the weather statistics are very favorable. And before then is an annual solar eclipse that goes across uh, the Mexico Yucatan and then into Texas and the most favorable predicted weather is in the vicinity of New Mexico, Albuquerque in, in particular. So for those of you in Kalamazoo, and I know it's the Kalamazoo Club in Michigan, uh, so I, I got some, uh, some maps from, from uh, Tom Hockey uh, as to uh, eclipses that went near uh, near Kalamazoo, but the last time there was an actual total eclipse in Kalamazoo was way back uh, over 600 years ago in 1451. Uh, but here we see the paths of the eclipse in 1831 and 18, 
34 that went not far from, uh, from Kalamazoo. And then uh, Tom Hockey uh, from Iowa gave me the map in 1860 as it came across. Um, and uh, I believe that's where the Corona Green Line was discovered and then and then 18 and then 1869 that they came down uh, from uh, from Canada uh, here. So these were not total in Kalamazoo, but these are maps that crossed the United States paths that crossed the United States. For the uh, 18 um, so uh, well I'm blocked here. Uh, but uh, David Barron wrote a wonderful book that came out for 2017, American Eclipse, the nation's epic race to catch the shadow of the moon and win the glory of the world. Uh, so that's been very popular and he won a writing prize and he's really interested in eclipses. And then Professor Thomas Hockey uh, has a new book about the 1869 total solar eclipse. And he asked me to write a foreword, which of course I'll do. Uh, as soon as he forwards me the book, uh, PDF uh, draft in the next month uh, or so. So here is Kalamazoo, uh, singled out in uh, Xavier Jubier's Google uh, Google map here, and uh, uh, you'll have a partial eclipse here that lasts a couple of hours, with eighty-eight percent or so of the sun covered. Uh, in uh, it was, so that was the eclipse back in 1954, and I think I remember as a boy watching TV from New York City that there was an eclipse of the sun and being inspired by it. But I can't pin that down from the age of 11. But that's where, where the eclipse went here in 18 in 1954, and uh, you would have seen 88 percent from Kalamazoo, uh, and then. Uh, well, and then here's another uh, another map there. And then in 2024, coming, uh, the Kalamazoo is going to get a 96% or so uh, eclipse. And of course, you're all smart enough and who are now in Kalamazoo and at the club to travel to wherever. Uh, you don't have to go that far to get into the path of totality. But uh, the uh, cloudiness statistics are not the greatest uh, in this area of the country in April, and they are better in Texas than here in, the, in this uh, region, and they're better statistically for low clouds in uh, Mexico. Uh, so I intend to be in Mexico for the eclipse. Recently, I've worked on a couple of different uh, books relevant to eclipses. One is joined with the art historian Roberta Olson uh, that came out from um, from uh, Reaction Books uh, a couple of years ago, distributed in the United States by the University of Chicago. Uh, and then I worked with Leon Golub about a book on the sun in, uh, in general, that is uh, copyright 2017. And after that, you'll have to wait uh, until uh, 2045 for another eclipse in the United States, which you can watch from Disney World uh, at that time, or even Miami, uh, as the eclipse uh, comes, uh, comes through for a minute and about 45 seconds in 1945. And then uh, if you're around on May 1st, 2079, uh, the eclipse starts here in the United States, low in the sky, and goes over Greenland uh, here. Um, but on this particular eclipse, uh, New York and Boston are in the path of totality, as is Williamstown, Massachusetts, where I'm talking from uh, from now. And uh, it's a, here's upstate New York, here's New York City, and here's Boston and uh, the center line here at, at the beginning of the eclipse. And here's the very elongated shape 
of the shadow uh, at, uh, at that time. So, uh, so I'm talking now from Williamstown, Massachusetts, north of Pittsfield in the upper left-hand corner of Massachusetts. And, uh, uh, and we're gonna get uh, over a, a totality there and uh, about 50 seconds. So that, so that won't be ideal uh, in any case. But uh, it's only 57 years, two months, 25 days. So if some of you watching are, are the students who are 20 years old or so, might be only 77 and uh, might have a very good chance of, uh, of seeing that eclipse on May 1st, 2079. So I'm glad to take uh, questions. And uh, Tom, do you want to handle? Great. Um, I do. I, I'll start with the first question. Uh, you asked me, and you didn't mention it during your talk, but where were you for the 2017 eclipse? I was in Salem, Oregon, on the grounds of uh, Willamette University, uh, with a whole bunch of uh, eight students from Williams College and a, a lot of uh, um, colleagues. Uh, we were on a balcony of the math building at that time. And we did have a tour group with us. I often have a tour group. Uh, I've been working with uh, Mark Sood uh, since the India eclipse of 1980. We've done about 15 tours together. So he's busy rounding up lodging now for the 2023 uh, uh, annular, 2023 total, and 2024 uh, total eclipses. And in fact, in 2022, there is no uh, annular or total uh, uh, eclipse, no central eclipse in 2022, but in uh, April, there's a partial eclipse that'll be visible from the southern half of uh, Chile and Argentina, where I hope to go. Uh, and then in, uh, uh, in October, um, it includes uh, Europe, and we're uh, arranging a, a nice little tour to a couple of days in Oslo, and then to by train to uh, Bergen uh, in, uh, in Norway to see that eclipse. But the eclipse itself is visible from all over Europe and, and as far east as uh, Kazakhstan, where they actually don't intend to go at this time. I'm looking for Oslo in October. I have a question. I have a question. Uh, well, actually, two. Um, one, so, the uh, so Greg. Uh, so Greg, spectrum. I should say, Greg, I yeah. spoke to Greg before everybody else signed on. So he reminded me that we were at a very nice eclipse uh, in the snow a little bit in uh, Mongolia in 1997, as well as on a ship in the Pacific in 2005. But go ahead, Greg. Okay. Um, two questions. One, um, you showed spectra was taken through the... Uh, airplane window. Would the airplane windows interfere with absorption of some wavelengths? Would that be known or was that tested out ahead of time? And the second question is, why is the Eastern Hemisphere preferred? There's so few eclipses in the Western Hemisphere in North and South America. Is there a reason for that? Well, I haven't been aware of that phenomenon if it's in fact real. So I can't answer that question right away. We can discuss that offline. Uh, but the, the question about the airplane window yeah. is that Aris did get an extra flight uh, from uh, Asian, Asian Airlines back in Greece yeah. uh, before, uh, before we took off. Uh, but unfortunately that was on the Airbus that we wound up not using. Uh, but uh, but certainly uh, he's doing calibrations to see okay. what effect maybe there may be in the windows. So right. so we know there's a blurring from the windows, and I don't know about the the wavelength. But we're right. always busy. We're always trying to calibrate on something. Right. So it's probably well calibrated anyway. Yes. All right. Yes. Thank certainly you. We're paying, certainly we're paying attention to the calibration and wavelength. 
Any so other questions? I, I, I have a question. Uh, what was the most memorable eclipse that you participated in? Always the next one. <laughs> You're not going to pin me down as to liking any better than any other. They're, I assume, they're, all, they're all great. I assume the longest eclipse you saw was probably 91, which was the longest that century, as I recall. Well, it always, it always seems um, that, uh, that everything passes by in just seconds. So I'm actually not big on the durations of eclipses. The 91 was my biggest disappointment um, because the storm came up. We were on, in, in Hawaii where I decided to go so as not to deal with Mexican customs to go down to Cabo San Lucas. And I outsmarted myself. Uh, in that we saw only a, a bit of the of the partial eclipse from Hawaii because of the storm that came through. So, uh, so I actually use uh, Jay Anderson's uh, clouding statistics at eclipsophile.com, E-C-L-I-P-S-O-P-H-I-L-E.com. And, uh, and the most important thing is to see some part of it uh, and not the longest. Uh, and so I select where I'm going from the cloudiness statistics. Yeah, Jay was one of our guests in uh, 2017 for our special event at that time, along with Fred Espinak. Yeah, Jay Anderson, yes. Yeah, yeah, he's great. Any other questions? Yes, and, and in, fact, in fact, at this last eclipse, I mentioned the people on Antarctica, I mentioned our planes, of course. There were 14 cruise ships uh, that were in those oceans uh, that you saw, the, the uh, Scotia Sea and the Weddell Sea especially. Uh, but uh, even a few days before, uh, Fred Espinak and, and uh, uh, Michael Zeiler were in, uh, were in uh, Buenos Aires about to fly down to get their ship from Ushuaia at the bottom of, of uh, Argentina. And, and that ship was canceled when a couple of crew members got COVID. So they just flew home. And then uh, that left, I think, 13 ships out uh, around in the Pacific, which is no, not in the Pacific, the Weddell Sea, which is known for being especially rough. And uh, I, I know my friend and colleague, Alex Filipenko, who you mentioned before, who just won the Education Prize at the American Astronomical Society. I'm very pleased to have a co-author uh, with me on the fifth edition of the textbook that I've been working on for a few decades. Um, and in, in they were towards the beginning, uh, he wrote me from some island that they were docked off, but it was too rough for them to even land. So the conditions there for a week or so weren't great. And it turns out that the uh, only ship uh, that got to see uh, totality was the one that Jay Anderson was on. And uh, whether that's a coincidence or not, that because he was freely dispensing um, advice, but, uh, but uh, only one of those 14 ships actually got to see uh, totality. Other than that, it's dramatic to be under clouds that gets dark abruptly, uh, but uh, that's uh, a phenomenon that, uh, uh, that obviously is better to see it clearly. I have a quick question. So, so what is with the orange pants? How did that originate? Oh, yeah. um, I don't know how it originated. But the Wall Street Journal article, uh, the reporter asked about it. So I do have this compendium of pictures in the archive at totalsolareclipse.org. And, uh, and we found some back, uh, back in, the, in the 1970s. So it just became a tradition. So I have several pair of long pants, short pants, uh, uh, et cetera. It's, uh, it's just something that's a tradition, and I'm grateful to my wife to remember to bring them along in, uh, 
in going to uh, in packing for the eclipse. So it's not for good luck. No, I'm certainly not a superstitious person. I, I was going to say you're a scientist. You should know better. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to claim it's a, it's a tradition. Hello, Jay. Hi, Fred. Hi, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for allowing me to enjoy the eclipse vicariously. Um, even though our cruise was canceled in Buenos Aires, I, I do get to, to have uh, bragging rights about flying my wife down to Buenos Aires for a wonderful steak dinner on Thanksgiving and then return home the next day. Hi. 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 Well, it was... Uh... But it was a disappointment for me when I heard that you had to fly home right away. And yeah, I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to see you while we were down there. But it was we were literally in Buenos Aires for 36 hours. Well, it's a nice place to be for 36 hours. I hope the airline miles uh, have some use to you. <laughs> yes. But, uh, in any case, since we do have a hundred or so people watching, let me. Uh, explain especially that this is uh, Fred Espinac who for many years ran the NASA uh, web, Eclipse website although he's a planetary scientist basically I think uh, and uh, when he retired from NASA he opened EclipseWise.com so there were still some people many people mistakenly go to the uh, NASA to look for the website but all the latest stuff is on EclipseWise.com which I recommend very uh, substantially for you all to look at. And I'm honored, Fred, that you came on to this talk. Thank you so much, Jay. Pleasure to be here. It's good he was finally able to join us for a general meeting considering he's been an honorary member for the past few years or so. <laughs> well, Fred did retire down to Portal, New Mexico to, uh, for the quality of the skies for, for nighttime telescope work there. So he does work a day and night. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, hopefully a quick question. So how, how did, Jay, how did you get into solar eclipses? Uh, well, um, this, uh, there just happened to be one uh, off the coast of Massachusetts when I was a freshman at Harvard with Donald Menzel. And so we flew into the path of totality. Uh, we saw it out the window. Um, there were a couple of other people whose names you might recognize were on that flight uh, with us. Uh, Don, Don Goldsmith has written a number of books on, uh, on uh, astronomy, John Leibacher. He's now the editor of the journal Solar Physics. I was corresponding with him today about our scientific article about the 2017 eclipse. Ken James was professor of astronomy at, at uh, uh, Boston University. And, and uh, so at the 50th anniversary, I actually discovered that one of the girls had overslept. Uh, so there were only 11 of us on that charter flight. Um, but uh, it, was a, it was an inspiration for me and I think to some of the other people as, uh, as well. Uh, but then there was a little bit of a hiatus uh, till 1963 when I was graduating and there was an eclipse in Montreal. Um, and one of the ones that I'm sorry I didn't get to go with 1968, I was supposed to go with Menzel to, uh, to Russia for the eclipse, but then the Russians invaded Czechoslovakia and the exchanges, uh, such as the National Academy of Science one that was that Benzo was on, and I was accompanying him, uh, uh, wound up getting canceled. So there's a, an individual story for each of the uh, uh, eclipses, and it's it's nice to have all these stories. And I do have a website at totalsolareclipse.org uh, with an archive uh, that has something about each of those eclipses. More questions. Hearing none, 
We uh, thank you for joining us. It was an absolute pleasure to have you as a guest speaker. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I just want to take the time to thank you again uh, for a field guide to the stars and planets. Because again, that, that, that book meant a lot to me back in the 80s. It was a great teacher. Good. So now, and now you should try the field guide to weather in the same series with uh, Jay Anderson as first author. And I did especially the appendix on weather on the planets. And he did the really the bulk of the book uh, on uh, on various uh, weather phenomena that should be of interest to most of the people watching this. And I do thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I'll check the book out. I should be an expert on weather living in Michigan and all because we get enough of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Well, you're certainly welcome to join us, but we're going to go ahead and move on with the rest of the meeting. So thank you, Jay. Thanks again. It, it was fantastic having you. Okay. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll leave you to your meeting. All right. Unless you have any last questions for me. I guess not. Okay. So long, everybody. Bye-bye, Jake. It was great to have Bye, you. Jake. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Jake. Bye. All righty. Let's go ahead and move on here. So the first thing is we have a nice uh, short presentation here. I wish we could do this in person, but uh, one of our new members, who's also new to the board, uh, has earned her first Astronomical League Observing Award. So I want to uh, uh, congratulate Anna Daly for completing Beyond Polaris. So uh, Anna, let me uh, let me highlight you and uh, go ahead and hold up hold up your certificate there a little higher. There we go. So there it is, a certificate of achievement for Beyond Polaris. Fantastic. And you got the pin Lovely as well. Pen. Yes. Oh, nice pin. Yeah. What's the picture? I can't quite. Got a up. little astronaut reading a book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, do you want to tell us more about the Beyond Polaris program? I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, it's kind of an introductory astronomy program. So there's some things where you're learning astronomy. Uh, there, you have to learn star party etiquette, evaluate your property for light pollution. Um, explain the difference between meteoroids and meteorites to somebody. There's uh, some sketching, like sketch the solar system, sketch the moon, some ob actual observing, like uh, one of them is um, observe two planets, observe stars or other objects in 15 uh, constellations. Um, so it's just general information, some observing and some sketching. But I thought it was a really good kind of overall introductory astronomy program. Great. Yeah, that sounds like a good one to start with. How do you uh, jo join that? How do you find out about that? You can go to the Astronomical League website. It is linked through most, most of the pages on our website. And they have a whole section on observing, observing awards and stuff like that. So there, there, there are quite a few. And Aaron Roman is our coordinator for the program. Um, so he can answer questions to you. There is an observing special interest group. Yeah, yeah. and Anna just, just posted a really extensive spreadsheet because she's a spreadsheet fanatic, which has all these different observing programs. Richard and I would be very familiar with a bunch of them because we knocked a bunch off in the you know, 10, 15 years ago. And uh, it's definitely interesting if you link in um, with her through our, our uh, observing SIG she'll send it to you and it's uh, posted. It's really pretty, pretty nice to see where to get started with it. Yeah, I made it nice and sortable. So if you have, if you want to do imaging, you can sort by that. Or if you have a certain size telescope or binoculars, you can sort by that. If you want to build something. So hopefully everybody will find it useful. Great. Well, again, congrats, Anna. I hope it's the first of many. Thanks. Yeah, I'm working on the Constellation Hunter one as well. So. Oh, great. All right, let's uh, move on here. The first thing I want to talk about is uh, related to tonight's presentation is with the appearance of Jay Pasikoff here tonight. It is uh, time to start making plans for the upcoming eclipses. Of course, we have an annual eclipse on October 14th, 2023. We have a total solar eclipse on April 8th, 2024. And of course, those are going to be uh, passing through uh, Southern Texas. So let me show you the map from Michael Zeller. Uh, Jay mentioned him. If you're not familiar with Michael Zeller, he's a cartographer and he also maintains the uh, 
great American Eclipse website. So between his interest in map making and uh, eclipses, he has some excellent eclipse maps. So here's the path of the 2024 eclipse. I thought I would just show that one and I lost where it is already. And uh, so here's uh, San Antonio. And so my plan is to be somewhere around here for both eclipses, but you know, according to Jay, 2023 uh, is gonna be better in New Mexico than it will be from here. But I was hoping to use 2023 as a, as a uh, reason to scout out eclipse sites for the big one in 2024. Now for this, um, for the 2017 eclipse, basically all of us went our own way. Uh, you know, some members did go to Sparta, Illinois, but most of us were all along the eclipse path. There's a whole gallery page on our website showing uh, uh, experiences all up and down the uh, path of totality. Uh, but since this one is more April and not August, where it's the height of vacation season, I don't know how many people were planning on taking either short trips or extended trips, but I was thinking we could try to find some place to... Uh, you know, to, to rent or, you know, um, pay for, you know, like some ranch or park or school yard uh, west of San Antonio, somewhere around there where we could go together as a group and observe the, at least uh, the 2024 eclipse for sure, but maybe the 2023 eclipse depending on the weather. So uh, that's kind of kind of be our first goal. We can try to find someone to talk to. I've already mentioned this um, during the lecture series to to people uh, from the San Antonio club, but I didn't really hear from anyone that represents the club itself, just a member, but uh, we should probably contact them and see if they can recommend a good site for us to go. But uh, how many folks would be interested in doing a group trip for 2024 where we could, you know, you know, not necessarily travel together, do like a caravan. Although if we meet some hooligans, we could take care of them together. <laughs> but um but, you know, somewhere where we could go for 2024 to, you know, set up at least a day or two in advance and take some sweet pictures, because, of course, that's all that matters. If you don't take a picture of it, it doesn't count. <laughs> that's just my opinion. But, uh, but that's my... Uh, that's that, not true. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's along the line of what I'm thinking is we try to find, you know, somewhere to go as a group. Because I know some members are going to do it local. They're going to try to go to, like, Ohio or Illinois again. But, you know, as Jay was saying... Good luck with that, uh, because it's April and the weather. So, discuss. Let's hear uh, how many people want to go to Texas for 2024 and maybe 2023. Well, I don't know if we want to go to Texas necessarily, but that might be okay. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going. I would like to go somewhere, and I was thinking originally the Sparta area again. I don't know if Sparta will work this time, Don. I think that's a little off the path, is it? Isn't it? Well, the, the air, general area, I mean. Yeah. Some, somewhere in that general Carbondale area. Well, I'm, I'm talking to the people that really want to see it. Those that really want to see it. Hey, if, if we you really, really want to saw see it. it <laughs> you want to go to Texas. So Texas no. has some really, really dark skies. And we had been looking at Texas anyway. It looks like it's very promising. So how about uh, there north in, of uh, San Antonio? How does that look Texas-wise? Weather-wise, it's really good. Uh, dark, dark skies, I'm not sure. But what I, I was thinking, uh, at least Pete and I were talking about it, is going to that RV park in... Um, Marathon. Marathon, that's it. Marathon, Texas. It's over on the west side of the state, kind of where uh -huh. the Texas Star Party is. But that's a dedicated... Uh, it's, well, it's not dedicated, but it's like an astronomy RV park under Bortle One skies, you know, as dark as what we have at ASV or darker. So I was thinking about going there either before or after the eclipse and then going to San Antonio for the eclipse. Well, that sounds better. Would it help if I don't go because I'm kind of bad luck? Well, Joe, if you stick with us, I think you'll be in better chance. You should have uh, you should have hit the road. You would have saw it easy. <laughs> If you would have traveled just a little west, you would have been fine, like like uh, Kevin. You shouldn't right. ride with me, Joe, because uh, I was trying to take pictures uh, with my little setup, and everything worked great up until about eight or ten seconds before totality, <laughs> and the whole <laughs> thing fell apart. <laughs> yeah, but we had great skies that day, so yeah, we sure I, did. I'm going to go with whatever I can do. Yep. 
So what I'm thinking here is maybe we should um, schedule just a, a special Zoom meeting here in the near future, just for people that are possibly interested in going to Texas and we can start to talk about and coordinate plans because that's what I want to do. Sure. Sounds like a good idea. All right, so let's do that. All right, moving on here, I just want to mention again, as I did last month for the Perseid potluck picnic in August, we're looking at either August 6th at the Kalamazoo Nature Center or August 13th at Van Buren State Park where we could go to the lakeshore. And it sounded like last month, most pretty much everyone uh, was interested in going to Van Buren State Park on August 13th. But um, I, I have not heard from anyone that, you know, does not want to go there because you know, I we should probably do like a little survey, but again, you know, does anyone have any objections going to Van Buren? Would you not want to drive that far for a club picnic or does that sound pretty good to you? No, Van Buren sounds good to me. Uh, it's not that far for, for, for going to the lake. It's not, right. that, I don't think. Okay. So look like we have a, um, in the chat, you should try Fort Davis, Texas it has great dark skies. Oh, yeah, that's the home of the Texas Star Party. Yeah. Pretty close anyway. But uh, Marathon's darker. Marathon's a little further south, a little closer to Big Ben. Mar Marathon's a bit darker than even the Texas Star Party. You and Pete have looked into that already, apparently. Yeah, Pete, Pete was the yeah. one that discovered that RV park, and the place looks really, really cool. So. It's yeah, got a one on the Bortle scale. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, very, very popular with imagers. They just drive to have a hotel. You can get a hotel room or you can park your RV or whatever. Um, but yeah, a lot of imagers, especially from this part of the country, they go down there right now where it's sunny, no clouds. So if anyone uh, would prefer to the Nature Center and you don't want to say, you know, just, uh, just send me a quick little email. I, I, I'm just curious to see how many members we can actually get to go to Van Buren? You know, I, I'd like to get at least, you know, 30, 40 people to attend the picnic. That's what we usually get. So, um, you know, I, I'm just interested in hearing a little bit of feedback because that's something I don't get a whole lot of. Uh, the last thing I want to mention here in the president's report, you probably haven't gotten it today, but you, you could have. Uh, but yesterday I mailed 131 membership cards. So if you didn't get it today, you'll probably get it tomorrow, at least if you live in the Kalamazoo area. Those of you that are out of state, you might have to wait a little bit longer. So uh, those were a lot of fun to fold and stuff. And um, I want to announce, I mentioned this at a board meeting a while back, but once I run through my current collection of, uh, you know, the business card sheets that you break apart and that I use for membership cards. Once my current supply is gone, that's it for hard copy uh, cards. I'm going to switch to an e-card from now on that you can maybe show on your phone for the very few times uh, that you might have to show a membership card. Because I, you know, <laughs> I get emails from members all the time saying, "Do I have to renew my membership?" or something along that line. And I'm like, "Well, when in doubt, you know, check your membership card." And they're like, oh, "I lost it. I don't know where it is." So. That's it. I'm not, I'm not busting my butt, milling out these hundreds of cards and people just, just freaking lose them. So we are going to e-card. It'll, it'll be cheaper. Everyone has your, your little silly smartphone. Those of you know, I can't stand them. And um, I got mine. So, so, so that's what we'll do. Yeah, you got your smartphone, Joe. Just not very smart, though. Smart Alec. <laughs> All right, moving on here. Uh, do we have any observing reports? We've had some clear skies. It's just that... Uh, it's been pretty cold. Well, Any I observing? used uh, the solar camera, or camera, excuse me, <laughs> solar telescope, the PST, uh, for a couple of days and uh, still just a couple of uh, little sunspots right about somewhere near the middle and uh, some uh, small prominences, nothing really outrageously active. <clears throat> Did a few double stars last week. Uh, well, for for the am I? Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I wasn't I wasn't lighting up. Okay, um, a few double stars last week, and it was very cold, very cold. But it was, it was I was glad I did. It was fun. There I'm going to want to borrow that PST here in a couple of months. Um, yeah, I've got it here, and just let me know when, because we'll have to. You know, unless we, unless you go to the Messier Marathon or something, 
I could turn it, you know, back to you at a, you know, a view, a SAR viewing time. Just let me know. Okay, I will. Thanks. Um, I haven't done any viewing per se with the eyes alone, just using the remote telescope, but um, there was a pretty decent geomagnetic storm last night. So I don't know how many people check out the uh, Aurora from Churchill, uh, Manitoba, Canada on, on explore.org, but uh, oh. I just pulled it up and uh, there is Aurora right now. It's not as good as it was last night. I mean, the, the whole screen was just filled with bright green. Mm. And you could even see a little bit of reds uh, last night. This 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 stuff here, this is like amp glow from the, the camera. So uh, this is a, a live view from explore.org from again, uh, Churchill, Manitoba, Canada, which is like wow. way, way up yeah. there. So um, of course, don't don't go there now because we have a meeting, but uh, there, <laughs> there, there, there's but, some Aurora yeah. there. Uh, <laughs> right now so you can check that out uh, later it might pick up so that that is the limit of the uh, uh naked eye observations i've done i've watched aurora on the computer screen <laughs> any other observing something. what was that kathy i say at least you saw something we've had nothing but uh overcast skies for a long time yeah well we too you know yeah. that's typical for us in january but we did have some clear skies here recently. I think it's, uh, it was kind of getting clear, but I think it's cloudy again, but whatever. It is. Oh, joy. Any other observing? Yeah. We're here. <laughs> well, there, um, there you are. I uh, did uh, get my observatory open a few times. I've shot a few pictures of uh, Ceres, the asteroid, or the dwarf planet. <laughs> or the planet. And, uh, a few other objects. Um, there are two that I've been working on, one called the Fly Nebula, and I can uh, give you a, a quick look at that. Let me open it up real quick. Okay, that sounds like more like astrophoto sig meeting stuff, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, hey, you asked I mean, about it's, it's the observing I do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've, I've got such crappy eyes that I've got to use the camera. Ah, okay. Okay, so I can share my screen, and I gotta share this screen. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Uh, are are you looking at nebula? We yeah. are. Because yes, what I'm looking at says Carfax. Car. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, how much is that car? How much is this car selling for? <laughs> I don't know that nebula. The Carfax nebula. Yeah. I don't. I don't know that one. We're seeing the nebula. It's an astronomical okay. amount. So, so <laughs> you're seeing it. It's a it's a mixture of uh, reflection nebula and emission nebula with a little star cluster in it. They say it's like a miniature version of the Great Orion. Um, and you'll find this in the constellation Perseus. Every day. Huh. I okay, what, hold what, on. What, oh, I, I do not know that one. Very What's good. What's the Eric. number of it, Eric? Um, the, uh, number is NGC 1931. Okay, thanks. I always go looking for new ones that I haven't seen before. All right, thank you, Eric. Any more, uh, observing reports before we go on the news? All right, here are none. Uh, news, let me give you an update on the James Webb Space Telescope. We gave this as a preview at the last meeting, but uh, indeed it happened uh, on January 8th, the uh, second uh, primary mirror, uh, the, the, the second half of the primary mirror was deployed successfully, which put the entire primary mirror in the proper position. Uh, JWST was inserted at the Lagrange 2 point L2 on January 23rd. That went according to plan. And as of yesterday, February 3rd, Actual photons from stars have entered the telescope's de detectors for the first time. So uh, JWST has seen the light. Yay. Oh, so, so, so now they'll spend the next uh, six months or so, you know, getting it focused and collimated, and then it'll start uh, uh, revolutionizing astronomy. So that's pretty good. Uh. And I also heard that uh, the Curiosity rover has discovered carbon-12 in the Martian regolith, 
carbon-12 as, of course, the carbon isotope that uh, life prefer, uh, prefers here on Earth. So that's not a sign that Curiosity has discovered ancient life or current life on Mars, but it's one of many possibilities, but it's maybe likely a geologic process. And did anyone see the um, uh, Mercat uh, view of the galactic center on like say astronomy picture of the day? If not, let me share that uh, for you. So Mercat, is a collection of 66 or no 64 rating uh, this image of the galactic center. So this is the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way. Boss Richard, the galactic black Richard hole is got him. gone. I'm back. Zoom, uh, <laughs> Zoom crashed on me. That doesn't happen very often, but uh, Zoom crashed say, on me. We were unsupervised. Did you guys? <laughs> So did you see the image of the galactic center? No. No. Right, let me try I, that saw, I saw the black hole there. Right. Oh, that, that's something. All right, let's try it again. So, I saw for about two there. There you go. Oh, okay. So this is from Mercat, which is a uh, collection of 64 radio telescopes in uh, South Africa. And it created this view of the galactic center, which is just unreal. Wow. So of course you can you can put your uh, uh, cursor over the image, and of course it shows you many supernova remnants. But these are like uh, uh, radio filaments, and they're not exactly sure what causes them, but they might be related to Sagittarius A star and cosmic rays and all that sort of thing. You can read more on their website, but but this is a pretty remarkable image of the center of our galaxy in radio waves. It's surreal. It's amazing. Uh, which, which which website is this? That's astronomy picture of the day. If you don't go to APOD every day, you should. Every mm -hmm. single day. Any other astronomical news? I'm going to drop something in the chat real quick. I saw on bbc.com, it was an article about some people trying to make New Zealand the first dark sky nation. So oh, I heard a little bit about that, yeah. And ISIS is coming down, so get ready, South Pacific. Right, they're gonna they're gonna land uh, ISS in what 2031. Yep, and it's coming down in the south. I hope they don't miss again and end up in Australia. Oh, uh, that was only that, that was a Skylab mirror. That was only a Skylab. That's no big deal. M mirror went right into the Pacific, so that worked well. True, but, but yeah, I've been wondering about the International Space Station because with current events, I don't know how international it's going to be. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, they're probably looking just to get rid of it. Is it a is it a controlled uh, descent or yes? Oh, or... of course. You, you do not want something that big coming down wherever it wants. Ah, fly fast, take chances. It'll probably hit Pete's observatory. <laughs> <laughs> not that I'm using it right now, anyway. <laughs> I'll get a bigger one. So, so random question on that: like, who couldn't? Who controls the descent? Is there is there a specific country that controls that? Sounds like it's NASA, so so it's the U.S. Because they were the one that made the announcement that the thing's coming down in 2031. It's not like the Russians. Yeah, I think we have operational control. Yeah. I think that we make that decision. Unless NASA decides they want to, you know, spend money and keep it up longer, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I see Russia trying to hold on to it longer, but who knows? <laughs> Richard, Richard 20... that's our next that's our next fundraising. Yeah. <laughs> this is 2030, well, you're saying this is gonna happen? 2031 is what I heard. I think that's 2031. The okay. 31. Okay. China is building its own, right? Um, but they may not share. They have another one now in orbit, right? Yeah, yeah, Tian Gong is already up there. It's not as big. It's you know, it's more like um like a kind of like a Skylab mirror blend, but uh, that's up there now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know what life is like on ISS. I haven't really heard the details. As I recall, Mir stunk really bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what some of the U.S. astronauts that stayed there were saying. The place was really, really smelly. It's an interesting astronomical uh, factoid I heard yesterday on Discover the Universe, which is the program that uh, exists in Canada to teach teachers how to uh, teach astronomy. They were talking about the fact that when 
the James Webb Space Telescope was transported from California to French New Guinea, there were no less than five decoy ships that went at the same time as the ship that actually was carrying the telescope to prevent piracy. Wow, um, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> what are they going to do? Put it on Craigslist? <laughs> <laughs> but it's got gold. That's yeah. Right. yeah. I, I think gold. <laughs> yeah. Arr, you're going to plunder me a telescope. Arr. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Moving on here. Doesn't sound like there's any more astronomical events. So let's do the event horizon. I, I've been... I keep forgetting to check the weather all day, but tomorrow we have our first in-person event of the year planned, and that is the February freeze out at the Kalamazoo Nature Center. So that's tomorrow, Saturday, February 5th at 7 o'clock p.m. What does the weather look like? Anyone want to give me a report? I'm looking at the clear sky chart, and it looks like the cloud cover is good. The transparency is below average, and the seeing is... Bad. Bad. <laughs> Maybe it'll oh, improve. Michigan, of course. I'm so bad. excited. Yeah. Sounds normal. <laughs> well, if yeah. we do have clear skies, uh, if you do want to bring a telescope, you'll very likely, I, I would say a 100% chance, have to set up in the parking lot. Yeah. Because of all the snow we got right. on Wednesday, you will not want to try to drive back to the observatory. But if you don't want to bring a telescope, but you're, you're okay with taking a very short walk back to the observatory, uh, we will open up our observatory and do just a little bit of viewing for maybe an hour and a half or two hours through the Ashby telescope. So we can do that. Why um, don't you make a decision on that, Richard? I'll make a decision uh, tomorrow afternoon, probably about three o'clock or so, and I'll, okay. I'll post it on... Uh, on the website and probably okay. on uh, the Twitter. Okay, good. Okay. We'll keep an eye on so, Keep a lookout for that. Yeah. I might send out a little email about it too. We'll see. Oh, sure. that would be great. Thanks. And then uh, on February 12th, we have part three of the Introduction to Amateur Astronomy Lecture Series. Uh, let me give you an update on that. To date, uh, over 1,070 people have registered. So that is just unreal. We got 900 all of last year, but right now we're up to 1,070. A little over 500, probably around 515 or so actually attended part one. And then we had a little over 400 uh, attend part two. Uh, so the attendance is fairly comparable to last year, but maybe a little bit higher, uh, which is uh, pretty understandable considering registration is much higher. And I do wanna thank uh, Aria, uh, Arya Jayatalaka uh, for monitoring the chat for parts uh, one and two. Uh, I want to thank uh, Kurt Kurista, our resident professional astronomer, for answering questions in the Q&A for part one, and uh, Kevin Jung for answering questions for part two. I am looking for volunteers to answer questions in the Q&A for parts three and four. So part three is on binoculars. So if you're well-versed in binoculars and binocular mounts, we're looking for someone to answer questions in the Q&A section. And we, of course, need someone to answer questions for part four, which is on February 26th on telescopes. So if you want to volunteer now, let me know. Or if you want to email me, uh, either way works for me. And the donations from the happy customers are rolling in. Yes, uh, I guess I can mention it here. Uh, we are currently over twelve hundred and sixty dollars in donations, so that that's probably, great, greatly probably, appreciated. Prob if you count the uh, uh, purchases of equipment like uh, planet spheres and the occasional hat and pins and whatnot, and the supporting memberships, it's probably more than that. Yeah, we have picked up, boy, at least. Uh, at least a half dozen memberships so far because of the series. And we, yeah, we did sell a lot of planet spheres after uh, part two. So that was so, so many, I had to order more. So if you do not have a Miller planet sphere, you can order one from our website. And, uh, you know, the smell of a new Miller planet sphere, you know, ah, wonderful. So yeah, go ahead and order <laughs> yours today. It's, it's better than your new car smell. 
scented like the universe itself. Yeah. All right. Uh, we do have a board That's meeting. Our, mirror. <laughs> we have a board <laughs> meeting on Sunday, February 13th at five o'clock. So we'll give board members a reminder on that. But of course, uh, any KAS member is welcome to attend a board meeting that will be on Zoom, of course. And we have a astrophotography SIG meeting on Friday, February 18th, 8 o'clock. And again, we have another great speaker for the uh, Astrophoto SIG meeting. We have uh, Agapios Ilia, who will be talking about planetary imaging. And, you know, that by itself doesn't sound too remarkable, but our speaker, Agapios, I, I think I'm saying that right, he'll be joining us from Cyprus. Whoa. Nice. Not not like Cyprus, Michigan, but, you know, I don't know if there is one, but Cyprus, the island in yeah. the Mediterranean. When we start at 8 o'clock p.m., it'll be 3 a.m. for him. So if uh -huh. you contact me and say, I can't make it, Richard, it's just too late, I'm like, shame on you. For him, it's going to be 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so, um, so be sure you uh, show up for that. And show your support for him for uh, staying up that late for us to, to give a talk for, for our club. So we're very much looking forward to that. And I already mentioned uh, part four of the lecture series is on February 26th. That's on telescopes. And then we have our final online viewing session of the season on Saturday, January 29th at 9 o'clock. And I want to thank uh, Joe Kamiski for hosting the January online viewing session. So that was a bit different experience. So thank you, Joe. Well, you're welcome. Yep. The recording of that is on YouTube. So if you, if you did not attend, you can check it out on there. Uh, next, Prime Focus, our newsletter. Uh, as of today, uh, 69 people of 283, which is 24.4%, have actually downloaded the newsletter. Can you see the, uh, the tear running down my eye here? So at, at, that's just incredibly hurtful. If you have not read the newsletter yet, I never want to speak to you. <laughs> Wait a minute. I didn't download it, but I hey. read it online. I just pulled it up and read it. Well, that, mean, that means you click the link. So, so you click the link click and you read link. it. So yeah. I did read it. So 24.4% click, click the link. Yeah. I, I don't have a computer, okay, so quick, I haven't everyone, had a chance to download and print it yet. Excuses, excuses, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> I know after that play, it's going to go up. Like huh? number of times. <laughs> And I do want to thank uh, Sinclair for the uh, Don't Look Up review. Mike, how many, uh, how many viewings are you on now? Are you still at four? Or are you up to like a uh, Six now, and I can't watch it for a couple of weeks because it just made me so angry last time I watched Wow. Oh, come on, Mike. Was, you got to watch. <laughs> I was screaming at the TV set. I have to change channel. I got to find something else. I just finished watching the binge watching The Expanse, so I, it almost normalized me again. Just so long as you don't get hey, like Elvis and shoot out the screen. Uh, Mike, you got to go watch Moonfall now. Oh God, no! <laughs> I saw the preview for that. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bang my head against a brick wall for an hour to watch that. Shit. <laughs> You're not gonna see it in IMAX. Come on, man. Oh good lord, no! Oh my God, that that movie looks, that movie looks horrible. It looks terrible. I can't watch. What do you expect? It's a Roland Emmerich film. That's well, that's true. Uh, I may end up having to bang my head against a brick wall after I watch it for several hours. <laughs> and I did want to mention, um, everyone stay healthy. I do not want to publish any more obituaries in the newsletter. Of course, we had uh, Dick Gillespie pass away, and I uh, had something on the newsletter uh, about him in the January issue. But, boy, uh, usually we just have one once in a while. But for the last issue... We had, unfortunately, three obituaries in the newsletter of past members that have uh, passed away. Uh, of course, we had um, uh, Dave Moore passed away. We talked about him a little bit last month. And then um, Roger McPherson passed away. He hasn't been involved in the club in quite some time, but he was a prominent member in the uh, 60s and early 70s. And I don't know how many people remember Dayton Maynard. Remember at, at Camsey when we would hear a loud buzz? There'd be this weird, loud buzz in the room. That was from Dayton Maynard's uh, uh, hearing aid. 
Uh, so, if, so if you don't remember Dayton Maynard, you might remember the loud buzz that we would have at some of the meetings that he attended from his hearing aid, because that was pretty loud. Because <laughs> we were always wondering, what is that? What is that? What is that? And it was it was it was Dayton. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, Dayton. He, 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 he dropped out of the club around 2016. He never converted the email. And he would call me once in a while saying, I didn't get my newsletter in time for the meeting, you know, because with the PDF newsletter, sometimes I don't get it done until like the very end of the month. And so by the time it, it got mailed to him, uh, you know, the meeting would, would, have, would have come to pass if, if it was like really early in the month. So, uh, so I guess he just kind of dropped out for perhaps that reason, or perhaps his health was declining. But uh, again, everyone stay healthy. Uh, we don't need any more uh, obituaries in the newsletter for a while. They're not really fun to do. So again, if you have any uh, articles for the newsletter or you want to share some astro photos or more reports, they are welcome at all time. Is there any other items anybody wanted to mention? Or bring up or discuss? Uh, Mike uh, Sinclair, I did want to ask uh, to give an update on the KPS uh, policy. I heard they're going to continue with masks for the end of the year. But they allow they allow groups for 100. Is there any change in meeting at Camsey? Yep, they've uh, they're allowing groups of of over of 100 people or more uh, back in the facilities. Um, we're still following a mask mandate. Um, our school has been in session uh, the entire school year. Uh, we've got a, I think, pretty close to a 96% vaccination rate. So we're, we're good there, uh, but we still follow a mask mandate. Uh, don't seem to have too many um, issues with uh, absences, which has been really good. Um, my guess is that if everything goes well, that we may be opening up um, in September, at least uh, if, if the process continues. I know we just passed the Omicron um, peak. It's dropped off pretty dramatically in Michigan. The last couple of weeks and uh, most of the projections is that should continue that drop unless we have some other weird variant um, and based on that it sounds like next school year we'll be back a full time um, as far as I know um, no masks will be required at that point but we'll see what the vaccination rate is there's a uh, KPS has certain standards for vaccination rates um, for in student but we can have um, meetings with uh, external groups up to, I think, a little over 100 with a mask as long as they follow the mask mandate. And we are adamant that you follow the mask mandate in all buildings. Right. Okay, so yeah, so outside groups can meet at Camsey now. Okay, we'll keep that in mind. All right, thanks, Mike. Anybody wanna mention anything else? Nope. I'm, I'm, can't, I'm gonna ask you a question. Sure. I'm from out of state, I'm in Virginia. So, yes. so how how many members are are from out of state in your club? Uh, it's a lot larger than it used to be. We probably have somewhere on the realm of maybe thirty people from out of state. Gotcha. Okay. And okay. we're I don't know. We're gonna try to maybe you know live cast them from Camsey from the Math and Science Center, but. If that turns out to be too much of an issue with the internet there, uh, we, we will definitely record them and post them on YouTube. We're going to try to keep up with that because I know, yeah, we have picked up a lot of out-of-state people. We've never made any promises about keeping the meetings on Zoom or anything, but we'll do the best we can. Oh, no, uh, no. And, and where I'm going with this is I, I loved your uh, the astronomy series. So... so. I, I, I'm plan to join the meeting. I plan to join the society, but okay. I was just curious how how many out of state people you had. Yeah, you can go to our uh, member profile page because on the member profile page are of course profiles, but it, it's a complete list of the club right now, and you can scroll through and see how many people are from out of state. It's 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 grown quite a bit since last year's lecture series and this year too. So you will not be alone. That, 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 that's for sure you get too many people from uh, the two time, time zones away? Uh, yeah, we've had people, you know, we, we do have some people from California, so that they're, they're you know, they're, they're three hours behind us all the time, so yeah. Had we had people do, do. From, the, from the UK uh, attend the lecture series, and uh, this year, uh, yep. I know of. Yep, quite a few. 
All right. So next month, uh, I, I mentioned uh, next month speaker at the very top of the night, but next month we have Dr. Fran uh, Beganel. I, I, I'll, I'll work on that pronunciation between now and then. Uh, she'll be joining us from the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, she was a team member of the Voyager missions back in the late 70s and uh, 1980s. And she'll be giving a presentation called Exploration of the Outer Solar System, the Voyagers and Beyond.